Hey there, it's your business guide, Michael Rager with Teach Your Business to Fish. Man, we're so glad to have you today. It's just amazing. Hey, Jonathan, I'm getting a lot of feedback in here. I'm echoing myself. So, we're really glad to have everybody on here and see what's going on. Um, maybe... There we go. I think that's going to do it. We had somebody on camera right before us. So we're going to come in here today. We want to talk about journey. Um, everybody, you know, we're all looking, always looking at the destination and destination and, you know, where we want to go, setting our goals and going there. But what's it about enjoying the journey? You know, I was, uh, I pulled out the, uh, the business, the business book today, Marlin Magazine. I uh, was uh, leading in the back, getting some new, uh, new business uh, ideas. And it was on the back, the, the back, uh, I think it was, uh, who was it? Uh, Skip Smith was talking about fishing the world and, you know, the places we can be going around the world and the things we need to do and the, the, the journey that we have. And, you know, it's, it's, it's those of us, when we started, man, I had no idea when I started my journey into working that I was ever going to do some of the things I did. You know, I, I remember one day I was on my boat with my mom and she, she asked me what I was going to do. I was like 12 or 13. And I, I told her I was going to scuba dive and I was going to do stuff with fish and all this. And she's like, yeah, sure you are, sure you are, you know. And, you know, I did. And it was it was amazing that, that I did that. You know, I became a dive master. I was a uh, uh, environmental consultant and worked on some major, major pipelines um, here in the U.S. and did some stuff on there. But I never thought I'd have been working in the oil and gas business, you know, ever. If you would have talked to me about that, I, I said it never would have happened. And our guest today, David Smith, I'm t David Smith, Jesus, come on, Rager. Uh, David Murphy, he's over laughing at me. I, I don't know. He's laughing in the corner. I can see him. David Murphy, uh, we were out, we were out uh, having cigars uh, about a week ago, a week or so ago, right? It was about that time, and and I was hearing his story. And we're gonna start with a little bit today, man, because the journey, the journey that people go on from where they think they're gonna go and where they end up is two totally, totally different things. You know, we've, we've got all these things that we want in life and the things that we're trying to accomplish. And how, do this, how does it happen? And how do we end up getting where we are and how do we enjoy it? And that's what a lot of the things that I see right now is I see a lot of people aren't enjoying the journey. You know, there's a lot of complaints what's going on, COVID and this and this and that. But you know, who, how many of you guys are taking the time to enjoy your kids, you know, having them home and, and, and doing these things. I was, I was talking to a friend of mine, Jason Jimenez, the other night, and he's going to be a, a guest here in a few weeks. But he was talking about how since COVID happened, he and his wife are strategically taking long weekends or longer weekends with their kids, you know, since they don't have to be in school. And they're being able to do some things and go out and educate and spend time and making memories with them. So it's, it's, it's enjoying the journey, you know. You know, we've all heard the uh, the cliche if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Well, you know, this last last year gave us something that was just kind of off track that nobody expected. And what did you make of it? And and that's the things that I want you guys to be looking at. I mean, talking to a lot of my clients right now about that. What are you taking your business and what are you turning it into and why are you doing it? But how are you also enjoying the journey? and enjoying where you've been and having fun with what you're doing, you know, cause that's a lot of what I'm doing. You know, those of you guys that are following me, we were, we were talking, um, blue ocean strategy in a, uh, in a, a networking call yesterday. We we're talking how things are different and in that blue ocean strategy. If any of you guys ever follow it in the marketing side, it's right up the teacher business to fish thing, you know, it's saying, okay, you know, here's this bait ball. And you know, what happens in that bait ball is you start getting tuna and mackerel and stuff coming in eating the bait and tearing it apart. And then the sharks come and the whales come and the dolphins and it starts tearing everything apart. And what happens is there's no real intrinsic value in the bait ball anymore. And what you get is you've got a lot of competition and a lot of competition in business is on price. You've got to, as a business owner, go create your own blue ocean because that other one's full of blood and guts and all this other stuff. You got to create a spot where you shine and nobody else sees you. And, you know, people are asking me, you know, that's why I did what I did. You know, that's where I came with the teacher business to fish thing. I, I can guarantee you there's nobody else out there right now using the fishing analogies and stuff to, you know, teach business owners about building their companies. And it, it's, it's really interesting. And a lot of things will come up, you know, Again, you know, David, David, my guest today, he, he inter introduced me to a guy named Eric the other day. Eric, God, he's, he just like came up with this idea of protecting tarpon on or reintroducing tarpon and getting the, the populations back up on the, uh, the south coast of Texas. And he threw it out in um, 
he threw it out on Facebook and you know, it's been like two weeks and the guy's got like 1200 followers and he's got people all excited in and he's, he's raised money to go start the non for profit and you know, just all these things that were happening is like, he came back and said, look, this is the journey that I want to go on. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to enjoy because these are the things that we enjoy in life. And that's what I want you guys to be thinking of today when we talk to David, because I'm telling you, he's going to share some things, you know, as he self describes himself now, he's at, uh, that, that big, that big city lawyer, with a small town feel, you know, he wants to be that lawyer that you're going to go sit out and, you know, have a cup of coffee or a cocktail with, and just sit and talk because you guys can talk business and you're, 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 you're that good friend. And you know, that's the kind of practice he and his team are building. And that's what we want you to see. But I'm going to tell you when we get talking about it, it's been an interesting journey. He's, he's laughing over me in the back. It's going to be some interesting things you're going to hear today. And it's going to be exciting to, 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 to hear how a life moves from what we think it was to where we are. So we good, Jonathan? We're going to poke it on out? All right, so we're going to poke out. We're going to go to commercial right now. We're going to bring back on David Murphy at Murphy's Law. And we're going to talk about the journey of becoming an entrepreneur. This is Mike Rager, your business guide. Go out there, be real success. We'll be back in a minute. COVID-19 transformed the way we do business. Now more than ever, fast lead generation and customer retention will determine if a business survives or not. The Now Media Video Business Card is designed to be sent using your smartphone. It's the next generation business card that will open the door for you while keeping social distancing. The Now Media Video Business Card is affordable for anyone from startups to multinational companies and is already being used by hundreds of businesses. Stay open, stay in business. Call us today. Managing a property can take the time out of your daily life, but property owners and landlords can turn to an experienced and trustworthy property management company to take the stress out of renting. LDA Management Services can make all the difference in renting a home whether you are a landlord or a homeowner living in the U.S. or overseas. We can monitor the status of your rental property and we can take care of any maintenance requests you may have. From accounting to tenant screening and maintenance services, we take care of it without you worrying about it. That's why individuals all over the world that are looking to invest in real estate in the Houston and the surrounding areas turn to us because we are reliable, we're trustworthy, and we offer the highest level of services for your home. And if you're thinking of buying, selling, or leasing a property, Elder Management Service can help you find that next great investment in the Houston and the surrounding areas by seeking properties and on and off the MLS. Elder Management Services has been awarded the Award of Excellence by the BBB six years in a row, including two Pinnacle Awards, which is the highest award given. Additionally, Having been a, been a part of NARPM for well over 12 years, including the presidency of the Houston chapter in 2018. Call Elder Management Services today at 281-894-8659 and let us take on the task of managing your properties with the highest level of standard. This is your business guide, Michael Rager. I'm back with you, and I've got David Murphy. I said his name right this time. <laughs> David, how are you doing today, my friend? Well, Mike, thank you very much for having me. Oh, man, it's awesome. It's awesome. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about your journey. I mean, we had, you know, I know, I know it's a big one. It's a long one. It's, a, it's an interesting one. But, I mean, you went from rock star to uh, well, real estate star to uh, attorney, man. How did that happen? Uh, well, so I've, I've always been, uh, since I was a little kid, I've always been interested in music. Uh, grew up here in, in Texas, up in, up in Dallas area. And before my cap could hit the, before my cap could hit the ground, uh, I was in a, in a U-Haul van going to California. I was going to be a rock star. I swear that was what was going to happen. I tried and did the whole thing out there. Had a blast. Spent six years trying to make things work. And then looked up and said, okay. How did I find myself in real estate in all this process? But well, it did. Well, let's, let's go a little bit more on the rock star side. I mean, you got to play with some cool people and play on some cool stages, though, didn't you? Yeah, we, we had a great time. Uh, let's say I was out there for six years. I actually went to Music Institute in Hollywood. That was a really cool experience. 
got to meet a bunch of people when I was in Hollywood, uh, backstage, all kinds of crazy stories. But it was it was an, am an amazing time of life, and it kind of forms. You're talking about the journey. The journey right. forms who you are and how you interact with people. And you know, maybe I'd be further along in my business life now if I didn't spend the six years trying to be a, a an artist. But I don't think I'd be the same person. I, I, that I, I am. It wouldn't have been as much fun either, now would it? Oh no, no, no! It was a blast. It was <laughs> absolutely a blast. Yeah, I got I got to um, be in clubs and and play stages with people that you know my kids didn't believe me, and then they started seeing some videos. They're like, oh, oh, okay, maybe you, maybe Dad isn't a liar. <laughs> So you went from rock star to real estate. How did how did that happen? Uh, that's actually a, a a really funny story. My uh, the lead guitar player in one of my bands, um, his mother worked for Dan and Kevin Costner, and they mm -hmm. had a finance company. Dan dealt with all the commercial real estate stuff, and Peggy, my my buddy Michael Foote's mother, dealt with all of the residential stuff. Okay. And so, uh, Michael and I were playing in a band at the time. I was working construction and didn't like it. And he said, why don't you come into the office? And so I was their office receptionist, go for errand boy. And so I started at the very bottom of real estate finance, mm -hmm. worked my way up through it, and got to working with a company called Quality Mortgage. This is the start of subprime mortgages before it got really, really nasty. Mm -hmm. um, and they had problems with branches that they had in Texas. And they said, walking down the hall, said, you're a Texan. You speak Texan. I'm like, yeah. What are you fixing to tell me? And so they asked me to come back to Texas and, and work on some, some uh, of the branches that were here. And I found myself back in Texas and okay, so you, focused on real estate. So, so you're there in real estate. Now you have a law firm. Like, what the heck happened there? So uh, that's kind of an interesting story. Uh, so I had my own uh, practices in real estate. We did finance, commercial, residential. We did some development, some real estate brokerage stuff, a bunch of different stuff up in Dallas. And... Um, my wife, when we were engaged, tried to go to law school. Well, she, she didn't try. She went to law school. She just mm -hmm. didn't like it. Okay. And I couldn't understand, why, why don't you like this? This is awesome. Right. And so when, fast forward, we're married for two or three years. Right. The market's starting to go sideways with the financial debacle in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I said, babe, I want to go to law school. Okay. And she said, Okay, well, we're moving to Houston because that's where my parents are. Cool. Hey, Jonathan, put David on camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Nobody wants to look at me. So, so we, um, we moved down here to Houston to go to law school. Um, I hadn't, honestly, I hadn't finished my undergrad at that point, so I had to finish undergrad before I could go to law school. Okay. And loved it. Uh, I was an older law school student. I was in classes with people that were anywhere from 20 to my age in their late 30s. Mm-hmm. And it was an incredible experience. Loved it. Uh, worked for Exxon Mobil. We talked about that. Yeah, yeah. The other night I worked for Golden Pass through law school. That was a great experience, great learning experience, great, great bunch of people to be with. Um, and then graduated law school, took the bar, and started working in private practice. So when you got into private practice, okay, you start, did you start working for another firm first? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. and then then you decided to go ahead. What what made you decide to say to go ahead and start your own firm? Well, so. Obviously, I'd been an entrepreneur before, mm -hmm. and um, I looked down about a year and a half into working for a, a larger firm here in the downtown area, and the majority of the clients that I was servicing were clients that I had originated. They were, yeah. they were, they were my people, so mm -hmm. to speak, if, there you, go. If, you yeah. can, if you can claim that. Um, and so I went home and talked to my wife and said, I think I want to start my own law firm. She looked at me and said, what took you so long? So what took you so long? Um, the, it's it's funny. I mean, the, the practice of law, you don't you don't learn it in school. Right. They 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 take and they remold your brain, okay. so that you think like an attorney, but you don't know how to practice until you've been out in doing it. So, going coming out of law school, I think it's critical that you're working in a group, that you've got other attorneys that you can ask questions to, that you can bounce you know ideas off of. And try to develop yourself as a practicing attorney. Because just because you have a law degree and you pa pass the bar exam doesn't mean that you know come from Sikkim. Right. You're still trying yeah. to figure out who you want to be when you grow up. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I see that a lot. I, you know, I've actually got um, friends I know, family members that, are, uh, that passed the bar, they did everything, and they do nothing with law. 
you know, they, they, they're done. I, I mean, I couldn't see myself going and, and studying that hard and getting a degree and passing the bar and then never do anything. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's funny you say that because when I, when I went to law school, I'd, I'd come out of being a business owner. Uh, my wife and I actually, it wasn't quite as simple as what I just laid it out to right. me. We had, we had quite a few number of talks. And the question was, well, you know, you've been a business owner. Why don't you go get an MBA instead of a right. JD? And we talked about it, but I felt like the JD would be a more well-rounded degree mm -hmm. than, than, I mean, no, no, I'm not knocking on MBAs by right. any means, but I just thought it would be a more rounded degree for me to, to develop how I looked at the world and how I thought. And I, I would say that I was right, um, but I know a lot of people that have gone to law school that don't practice I mean, they have their. They might have their law license, right? Or right. have had their law license and then and then let it go into a, a dormant state. But the the again the the practice is different than law school. And the law school is a development of your brain. The the academia is, is something completely different than anything I ever experienced. Anyway. Yeah, it it is. I, you know, I almost God. I was about 40 at the time and like you know like like we talked I was in the environmental side of building pipelines and I actually applied to go to law school I was going to go into environmental law I, I was looking at it I was very interested in, because we were working with FERC to help push regulations and stuff like that and I really wanted to get more into that but I found out how much I had to read <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there it went for me you know I've got the attention span of a net so, and I, I heard some of that stuff you're reading wasn't very fun at all. Well, no, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's more ministerial than anybody ever told me. Uh -huh. I mean, I had several attorneys that I worked with for my real estate practice in Dallas, and no one ever told me how much reading or how much writing, I mean, mm. that's what the law is. Right. It, it's, it's language and, and, and reasoning, and how can you put the language and the reasoning together to promote fulfill whatever it is your client's trying to put together, whether it's a business practice or a commercial real estate or, or something, you know, looking forward and you're trying to figure out what happens to me if I become disabled? What happens to my business? You know, how is that secession plan set up? And, and, and all those things uh, culminate together like a three-legged stool. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I want to talk, we got like five minutes left in this segment. I want to still finish on the, the, the journey you took to where you go, and then I want to next segment talk about the issues we have running and starting a business. But okay. when you start looking at your customers, who, who do you feel is the best customer that your firm serves right now? Oh, wow. Uh, we, have a, we have a lot of trade. Everything really for us is, has something to do with real estate. Okay. Um, whether you're a business owner that has real estate, whether you uh, are a real estate investor, or you're working in and around the real estate industry um, to to do your business, tradespeople, mm -hmm. plumbers, electricians, HVAC people. We have a lot of those clients because the law can be extremely intricate, and and knowing that your contracts and things along with your business formation is put together to work cohesively, not only with your plan but with your accounting and again your state planning, it, it's a difficult <clears throat> it's a difficult position. Who do you think, as a business owner, I, I've heard this go both both ways. So you're a business owner. You're getting ready to really move your entity to the next level. Who should be talking to first, the accountant or the CPA? Uh, well, the, the the attorney of the CPA. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry, the, the the attorney of the CPA. Yeah, the um, attorney of the CPA. Well, I I think that for me, when I'm working with a client, um, if they've talked to their CPA first and they've mm -hmm. got their financials in order and they've got an idea of what they're doing, it makes an easier process for us to determine what type of entity you want, okay. what kind of tax status you want, mm -hmm. and you know, what is your, what you're talking about, starting with the end in mind, starting your journey, your goal. Yep. Are, you, are you looking to raise a bunch of capital? Right. Or are you set like you are? A lot of that can determine what type of entity you want to put together. Yeah, I think that's really important. You see a lot of it, a lot of small business owners, you know, they're, they want to do it themselves. And you know, we both know that filing with the uh, Secretary of State and with, um, the IRS to get your your, your 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 stuff done is not difficult, but there's way more intricacies in forming your business that you really need to look at, is isn't there? Yeah, I mean the 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 consultative side of things is really where a good attorney is going to shine. 
Mm. Uh, like you said, filing online with the IRS, filing online with the Secretary of State, I mean, quite frankly, anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. um, no offense, but it's just, it, that's not, where the, that's not where, the, where the rubber meets the road. Right. Um, the issue is looking at the, the global picture of what your business is, where your contracts are. Uh, I mean, being a, being a solopreneur, mm -hmm. and it's just me owning a business, having an operating agreement or a, a company agreement for your LLC or your corporation isn't so dramatically important. You add another person in there and that company agreement, operating agreement becomes essentially a prenuptial agreement for your corporate marriage. Yep. Yep. I was talking to a guy last night, uh, met him, met him out. We were just having a talk and he, he's a man. I just walked away from a several million dollar a year business because they, they the partner that I brought in, he goes, I brought the guy into the business and we didn't do some things right on that operating agreement. And I didn't want to spend a whole bunch of money fighting it. It was easier for me to just walk away, you know, and we, we, we hear those things. And it's, it's funny how often we hear those things. We hear, hear that things go wrong and, and go from there. We got one minute left. Why don't you tell people how to get a hold of you right now? And then we'll, uh, We'll okay. come back and we'll talk about the interstices of building a business. Sounds good. Well, my company is Murphy & Associates. Uh, we're located up in Tomball. Uh, you can reach us on the web at murphyslawplc.com. Fun little twist I, there. I saw that. Um, or the office number is 281-475-2022. All right. So we're going to get back. We're going to talk to David. I hope that you got that little bit of a journey here, you know, because he's, I, I'm telling you, I heard a lot more when we were out the other <laughs> night. And uh, the stories we, we, we got to tell, and it's fun. But that's where you get to, you know, when you really get to know people. That's what it's about. You're hearing their journey and hear, hear where they, they, they've been and where they're going and why they're going. And, and, and that's what this is all about. This is why we own this business. And, you know, when we get to the end, we start talking about the kids and the fun stuff. This is Mike Rager, Teach Your Business to Fish. We're going to be back in just a minute. So, David Murphy. Do you want to experience the ease and convenience of the latest and most advanced home security system? Are you going away on vacation and want to have peace of mind while you're not at your home or at your office? According to the FBI, a robbery occurs every 13 seconds and homes and businesses without a security system are 300% more likely to be burglarized. Hawk Security provides security solutions to residential and small businesses in the state of Texas and from California to Georgia, building a custom tailored security setup that matches your needs. Whether it is home security, fire and carbon monoxide detection, flood detection, connected senior care, managed video surveillance solutions, alarm monitoring and life safety. In addition to fire and carbon monoxide detection, Hawk Security has a smart home business integration, expanding security services to a lifestyle solution, keeping customers connected to their home and businesses from anywhere in the world, from their tablet or mobile device. So you can have peace of mind even if you're not at home or in your office. Reduce your energy cost, scheduling automatic changes in thermostats or lighting. And because we rely on our heroes every single day, Hawk Security offers security services discounts to military personnel, veterans, first responders, educators, and hospital personnel. Our mission is to keep our clients safe, treat them like family, and provide them with a user-friendly security system with personalized customer service 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. For integrity, honesty, passion, and excellent customer service, Take a strong step today toward getting protected and call Rosanna Torres at 832-863-8574 because every home and business is unique and every security system should be unique too. Look at that. We <laughs> shot right back in there. Jonathan, you're not getting sleep, buddy. What's, what's going on with you over there? <laughs> See, I love you, man. And, uh, you know, 
It's just he's just keeping you on your toes. Slide my, you know. He did this to me the other day. He did this like a couple weeks ago. He's like, hey man, 30 seconds and boom, it came on. It's like we're sitting here just you know, BSing back and forth and going there. All right, so this is your business guide, Michael Rager. We're back with David Murphy of Murphy's Law. All right, David, what we're talking about now is we were talking about a little of this. Those of you who are watching us Facebook, Facebook heard a little bit of it. So I've worked with attorneys before, and one of the things I've had as a business coach and you know helping them in is they've always got their attorney hat on. They don't have their business hat. Sure. And it's sometimes it's a little bit difficult to work with them. How did you see when you decided to build this business? Because you came with a entrepreneurial mindset into starting the law firm. You didn't say, hey, I'm going to become a lawyer. You were a business owner first who became a lawyer. How, how do you think you looked at growing your business differently than most do? Uh, growing the law firm? Yep. Uh, well, it's funny. There's a, a really good friend of mine. He actually one of the law firms that I worked with before I started my own firm, John Davis for uh, KMD. Um, and when we were in law school together, he was a year ahead of me. Um, we were on a on a, an intellectual property <clears throat> competition team, and we talked about what was wrong with the paradigm of the attorney law firm practice model now. What we saw, and at the time there were a couple of larger firms that were uh, filing bankruptcy and going upside down, just mm -hmm. based upon the whole partnership structure and how the the divisions ends up end up working, and the fact that you've got. Um, you know, one, two, three year attorneys that are coming in and working 150 hours a week in the basement. Right. I mean, okay, great. You're giving them a hundred thousand dollar salary or whatever, but you know, multiply that out over 50 weeks a year at 150 yeah, hours. You're making, you can work at McDonald's and make more make money. Make more money. Yep. And so, uh, John and I had some, some long discussions and big, huge spreadsheets about how we could put this together, um, in a business process that would still make the business owner money. And, but allow the practicing attorney working for the firm to have more freedom to go to the baseball game, to have more time to go to the fourth grade play, because that only happens once. Yep, yep. And so in, in putting together the concept for my practice, um, it was that number one, we're a family, mm -hmm. and that's not, you know, that's not shtick, that's the where we are, we're a family, we're here to work together and pull each other's wait when needed. I mean, something ha happens in your family and you step in to help that family member. So, you know, the fourth grade play is coming. Yep. So let's get it on the schedule. And if there's an appointment or uh, something that needs to be done at that same time, let's get it planned and prepared so that one of the other members of the team can step in and do that. And you can go to the fourth grade play. And that I think is the biggest, one of the biggest shifts for us is being really a, a working family. Mm -hmm. as opposed to just a business. So everybody pulls together and we're a cohesive team. Yeah. When I first started coaching, I had a couple of attorneys that were clients and looking at some of those partner models, I, I mean, the cutthroatedness within the organizations of some of those big firms was ridiculous. I, I'm like, why would some people, my, my thought was, why would some people even want to be a part of it? You know, but you know what you're growing you know, you, you're a small firm. There's what you, one other, one other lawyer mm -hmm. in your group, and you've got a couple, you know, paralegals and stuff like that. But I think what you, you, you said when we met, you know, when you described yourself, you know, you want to be that small town lawyer, you know, in the big city. Yeah. If, I, if we can't go have a burger and a beer and talk about family and baseball and, you know, what movie you went to go see with your wife last, I mean, are you really building a relationship? Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's one of the key things for me is. I want to have a relationship with my clients so mm -hmm. that if they have a problem, they're going to say, okay, let me call my attorney. When I have someone mm -hmm. use the pronoun my, when they're introduced to me, right. Hey, this is David Murphy. He's my attorney. Right. I, I, I feel like I've created that relationship now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard it. You know, I become friends with a lot of my clients and when I was just getting into the business, people were like, you know, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. And I think it's kind of weird. I'm like, what, what do you mean? You know, if I'm friends with them, I really care about them. Right. I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell them the truth. And it's a lot of times people think your friends are friends, but they're not really friends because they really won't tell you the truth. And, you know, that's what people pay me for. They, they, they pay me to get them mad and to, 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 to move them in the right direction, to ask them the questions that real people, you know, other friends won't ask them, you know, but as a lawyer, how do your businesses, business owners look at you as a trusted advisor? you know, to help them move around. Cause I, I, I know lawyer, lawyers and accountants are usually 
you know, very trusted by their, by their clients when they really know them. I would hope so. I think, that, I think that that's part of the relationship. Like you were saying, um, if, if you don't trust me and we're not close, then are you really going to take what I say to heart or you think it's just going to be so much air in the wind? Right. So for, for us, we, we, we try really, really hard to listen and help them come up with plans that work for their global picture, not just the one question they're asking. And we also, we want to be that, that person that if you have a legal question, you're going to call me. It may not be something that I do. Well, we talked about that today before we were here. You had somebody, one of your clients called you on a, something totally off the wall that you don't normally do. Right. But if you weren't his friend, would he have done that? I, I don't think so. I mean, so I, I want them to call me. And if it's not something that I do, I've got somebody that I know that's in the profession that that is mm -hmm. what they do. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to be able to give a better referral mm -hmm. to my client and knowing who they're going to be able to work with and what that person does than Google is going to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. That's what, I mean, that's where building the relationship is, is all about that. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the struggles. So, you know, we both build businesses and mm -hmm. we have good things happen, bad things happen. What do you see as a common theme that happens in small business owners when they're really starting to take off? What, what are some mistakes that they make? Uh, I think I think the biggest thing is laying out your roadmap. Um, I'd like to say I'm not guilty of it, but I am. Yeah. I, I mean, <clears throat> it, it, when you're getting started uh, on a business, your, your focus is on sales and getting revenue in and, and how, is, how am I going to feed my family when I'm putting this thing together? Um, and not that that shouldn't be part of your focus. Don't get right, me wrong at all. Right. But at the same time, you should really be looking at where am I going to be six months from now, two years, three years, and what's the roadmap that I need to be on? What are the systems that I can start putting together? And, and I'm talking about things that don't necessarily have to do with law. Right. But what, what are the organizational systems that I can do to put together that are going to help my business grow and flourish? Um, and, and so I, I think that roadmap and, and teaching yourself, doing as much reading as you can about uh, business entrepreneurship. There, there are a million books out there. Some of them are fantastic. Some of them are okay. Some of them I wouldn't recommend, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what are you, some of your favorite, what are, what are some of the favorite books that you read to help you move along in your business? Um, probably one of the, the, the first books, it wasn't for law, it was actually for my real estate. Um, one of the first books that I really hit home for me, it's, it's an older book now, it's called Now Discover Your Strengths. Uh -huh. And the, the general premise of the book was that we're born with things that we're innately good at. Yep. They're natural to you. Yep. You can you can flourish and make those better. And there are other things that are, are not your strong suit. And you can work your tail off trying to get better at those things, but you're never going to be as good as someone else who has those as an innate yep. quality. Yep. So the book was helping you try to there was a test strength finder test mm -hmm. and whatever the book was helping you try to figure out what those things were and then the things that you're not good at the suggestion from the author is that that's who you're looking for as a partner, partner. Yep. or that's who you're looking for as a key man key woman yep. in your business i have i have an office manager kelly stubblefield she's my senior paralegal office manager she's been with me i think a month after i started a firm and i honestly I don't know where my left and right hand are without her. Right. Because she she is a, she's a driver, she's an organizer, she's she's a you know my my benchmark behind me. That was the missing piece for my strength finder piece. Mm -hmm. She fit it all. Yeah. When I when I was uh, training with John Maxwell, I think you may have read uh, Twenty One Laws of Leadership. That's mm -hmm. law number one, law of the lid. You know, it's work on what you're really good at and get better at it because you become great those things that you can't really, that, that, that are not your innate strengths, you know, don't spend as, time, as much time working on them. And, um, you know, find somebody else to sub it out with, bring in partnership, you know, do something with them, you know, because no matter how hard you try, you know, for me, if I, I know you're an accomplished guitar player, I, I tried for a while and I'm not good at it. You know, I, I, I know what I'm good at, I know what I'm not. I can hit a baseball, I can't play a guitar. Right. So, you know, when I was a kid, that's what I practiced and that's what I did. So those are the things that um, we, 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 we like to look at. So what were some of the struggles you guys had when you started building the business? What were the, you know, even having your business background and having your legal background, what were some things that kind of tripped you guys up that if you could look back and tell young David now, 
what would you what would you do different? I don't know how young I was, but okay, I follow, I follow your <laughs> younger point. David. Um, I, um, well, that damn Mike. Um, <laughs> that we, we talked about the FCC. Sorry. Yeah, the seven um, seven deadly words that George uh, George Carlin said we can't say on TV. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, I think um, struggling for getting your sales process down was probably one of the bigger ones. Uh, then the next piece was um, structurally. Um, what what software are you going to use? I mean, in today's day, I don't care if you're practicing law. Or, or you're selling air conditioning, you, you've got to have some sort of some technology ERP involved. behind you yeah. that's, that's working to, to put things forward. So going through and figuring out how that is, putting those things together, and trying to get, I mean, just like anything else, trying to get the systems together. How do I run this thing? Mm -hmm. It's one of the, that, systems and processes are one of the hardest things I've got with getting small business owners to look at because they know what to do. They, 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 they do it, that's what they're good at, but my, my I'm sitting there telling them, I said, look, you don't want to be doing this. Like we said earlier, 80, 90, 100 hours a week. You want to be bringing people in and you got to be able to duplicate yourself. Yeah. Getting it out of your head onto paper is, is I think, one of the hardest things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to self-admit here. I'm, I, I am this, what I'm talking about. There's also the ego of an entrepreneur. Yes. Of being the person. I hope I don't want to. I don't want to be the smartest person in the room, but I, I want to at least be in there with the, them. You're with them, yeah. And, and the ego. I mean, for 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 an attorney, problem solver, the ego of being the person that came up with the solution. Yeah. To fix well, the problem. It's really funny. We were brought into um, we had another company a few years ago that we started. We were getting ready to buy this software company, and it documented who did what, how, and why. And we met the business development manager for a very large law firm here in Texas. And she brought us in to talk to one of the partners because they wanted to refer us out to their clients because they thought we could save on some lawsuits and stuff that they were getting sued on. And so we, we demoed it and I looked over at one of the, the partners and he's just sitting there shaking his head. And I look at him, I go, what, what's going on, man? And he goes, you know, we got three key people here. They're none of my lawyers. Between the three of them, they got 109 years of experience in this, in this office. And we don't know what any of them does. We couldn't function without them, but we don't know what they do. Yeah. And my question was, is, well, how long are you going to wait to document it? Are you going <laughs> to wait till one of them dies? And um, they never hired us. They had us put together a scared them. proposal, and we came up with everything. This is what's cost. And, you know, I thought it was, you know, they were making, they were, I mean, they were a big law firm. And I don't know what they did. You know, every year I'd call the guy and, and I would say, hey, man, did any of your three key people die yet? <laughs> you, you joke. That's kind of a morbid thought. But, but it was, it, it, it's, it's, we need to do this. And I think I told you the story the other day about the guy that had the heart attack on the golf course. And he woke up and he realized that he had to document these things. Because you know, as, as the attorney, especially if we're building this business to sell it, you, that can't be in the owner's head. No, no, no. It's, it's got it's to it's come out. You've got to get it on paper. And, and you know, frankly, that, I think that's probably one of the hardest things to do. And I don't know if it's an ego thing, if it's a stop, breathe, <clears throat> write it down thing because you're running 8,000 miles an hour as a business owner, or if it's a combination of all of it. It's but a little bit of all of them. It's, it's funny as we did it on some bigger companies and we had people that did not want to give up how they did their work because they were afraid that if I told you, I wouldn't be valuable anymore. And our thought was, no, it made you more valuable because you could teach and you could get better and you can do what you wanted to be. But now that we know what you really good at, now we can promote you to do more things, you know? Right. And it brought that out and it was really getting people out of their own way. All right. So we got two minutes uh, before we go into the break. If you're going to give one, one key thing to a business owner that they have to do legally when they're ready legally. to set legally. So I'm going, I'm going to, I'm going to pull out the, 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 the attorney hat on you. What's the one thing you tell them they need to really do and spend time on to do it right? Uh, proper formation and realizing what the corporate veil is and putting things in, in a position where you're actually running a business and it's not an alter ego. Because you can go through all of this process, have thousands of dollars of paperwork and contracts put together, and if you're not operating as an independent business and it's your 
private bank account, mm -hmm. then you're going to get sued personally for everything the business owns and everything you own. Mm -hmm. So avoid the alter ego, I guess, would be my biggest. I, th I think we've all done that. And, um, you know, I think when we start, it's a hard thing to get out of, isn't it? I know. So we're there right now. I know I'm talking to my CPA about that right now because we shift some entities and I'm like, oh man, I can't keep doing it. I got to move this and I know I'm going to get in trouble with this. So, I mean, even, even, you know, I do it. You, you did. We know everybody does it. So we're going to go uh, to break again. We've got Jonathan ready to kick us out and bring somebody on and talk about and sell some money and, you know, do that stuff with the commercials. So this is Michael Rage, your business guide, David Murphy, Murphy's Law. We're going to be back in just a minute. COVID-19 transformed the way we do business. Now more than ever, fast lead generation and customer retention will determine if a business survives or not. The Now Media Video Business Card is designed to be sent using your smartphone. It's the next generation business card that will open the door for you while keeping social distancing. The Now Media Video Business Card is affordable for anyone from startups to multinational companies and is already being used by hundreds of businesses. Stay open, stay in business. Call us today. Hi, this is Scarlett Horton. You may remember me from the morning news. We know that finding the right team for your painting project can be overwhelming. And if not done right, a painting project can easily go over your budget. At Serta Pro Painters of Central Houston, our professionals will ensure your residential or commercial painting projects run smoothly and are convenient for your schedule leaving you time for what matters most. Serta Pro of Central Houston has been serving the Houston metro area for more than a decade and has a solid reputation. You can read reviews from our clients and see examples of our work on our social media pages, letters of recommendation, website, and Google reviews. Additionally, at Serta Pro Painters of Central Houston, we warranty our work for two years. We offer free color consultation. We do residential and commercial jobs, interior and exterior and we are licensed and insured. Not to mention, we are experts in painting cabinets. Serta Pro is the largest painting contractor in the USA. Our crews are not only qualified and skilled painters, they are the best at what they do, and we are always on time. Let our experts at Serta Pro of Central Houston transform your home and business. Our proven process gives you more time to enjoy moments that matter in the spaces you love. Alfredo, Mallory, and John are experienced professionals who will work with you every step of the way to ensure a flawless finish. Call us today at 713-824-5166 and let Serta Pro of Central Houston handle with ease, efficiency, and high professionalism your next residential and commercial painting project because the world needs color. Hey, this is your business guy, Michael Rager with Teach Your Business to Fish. I'm here with David Murphy, Murphy's Law. All right, David, we were talking in the break a little bit. Um, I want to get into talking the fun stuff because sure. that's how we really connected first. Is we started Absolutely. connecting about the fun Absolutely. stuff because who cares about businesses and legal crap? I, it's not me that wants the money. It's all the people I owe it to. I know. Everybody else wants the money in our life. We just want to go have the fun that the money brings. <laughs> right, and exactly. that's what it's all about. So you were talking a little bit about legalese and a change. How, how is that changing? Because, you know that the, the, the common guy can understand legal terms now. How is that changing in the world? Well, I mean, there's there's been a push for, for a while on moving the legalese into more plain English so that it's more common. And we were, what we were talking about is that, you know, having, having those bedrock people that work mm -hmm. with us that keep us in check so we don't yeah. mess up. Right. Um, and so the, the, the issue... In, it really relates more to litigation almost than anything else. Mm -hmm. Contract language is, has been pretty straightforward for a while, but the, the, the litigation side of things. And so I asked my office manager, Kelly, I, everything that we do, she reads through it. And does it make sense? Is that, is that plain enough? Are we direct? Because the, the thought process is that all the other is superfluous and doesn't really add to it. What, are you getting your point across to the people mm -hmm. who have to hear what you're saying? I mean, it's the same thing in contracts, but I don't think it's been quite as bad. Yeah. Now, it's, it, that's something that, that I know I had when I, when I first got into to business and trying to understand. You know, it, I, I hated the point that I had to pay my lawyer extra money to go back and explain stuff to me because it was written in a way that, like, what do you mean, dude? 
I, I don't get this. And so, man, it's, it, it, it is. And we were talking, you know, we've all got to have that person that keeps us in check because we can't, as you said earlier, we can't do everything well. So let's go down. You know, we got into business for a reason. Mm-hmm. And you said you got into business reason because you didn't want to spend 90 hours a week doing what you were doing. So why'd you do that? I mean, who's the, who's the important people in your life and what do y'all like to do? Uh, well, I've been married for, oh my gosh, how long now? Uh, 17 years. I'm not quite sure how she put up with me that long. Uh-huh. Um, we've got two wonderful kids, uh, Sophia and Eli. And uh, I mean, when it comes down to it, the family, just like talking about with the, with the work, family, the relationships, that's what life's all about. We're here as social beings. Right. And so creating that connectivity and do it, being able to have the freedom to go do those things. Uh, what we were talking about, if I can, what we were Good. talking about um, when we first met is um, my son getting to go fly fishing for the first time. Mm-hmm. And he, he's, a, he's a video gamer. I'm not a video gamer. He and I have a conflict with that, but that's a whole different I mean, game. <laughs> But we went up to Idaho at the end of the summer when they pushed school back for three weeks. Mm-hmm. My daughter, we usually, we usually do a, tr- a birthday trip for my daughter and my son. That, that's what we do. We mm-hmm. don't do a big party. We go somewhere together as a family and make memories. Okay. And so we hadn't gotten to do her summer birthday trip because of COVID. School got pushed back three years, three, three, years, three weeks. And um, she's like, you know, we had talked about going and visiting a friend of mine in Idaho. Mm-hmm doing it later in the year. She said, well, can, can we go now that school, school's pushed back? I said, sure, why not? And so we spent a week up there and owning a business, being able to say, you know, in a two week time frame or less, say I'm going on vacation well, and that, not having to have put it in. Well, that's owning a business. Yes. That's what owning a business is about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so being able to do that, we went up and we went whitewater rafting together with a fam- as a family. It was great. We had hiking. It was just an amazing time. But you and I connected because mm. of the fish thing with my right, son, right. who is not an outdoorsy kid. Mm-hmm. Told him we were going to go fly fishing. He was kind of, eh. And I honestly thought we'd be out there. We, we were out on the water, I think, like at 8 o'clock. I, I figured by maybe about 11 o'clock, he'd be done. And I'd want to stay, and we'd have a little conflict. And, you know, we'd figure it out, whatever. We were there until 7 o'clock that night. He had caught a huge trout for his first time going out. It was eight pound, 20 inches yeah, yeah, or so. Yeah, I saw the picture. It's a nice fish. Yeah, I mean, and just was over the top. So, I mean, seeing this kid, his smile was this big, uh-huh. a genuine smile, outdoors, breathing fresh air, having a good time. And we were, we were done, and I'd caught several smaller trout. It wasn't a bad day for me at all, right. but I hadn't caught the big one. Right. And he didn't want to leave until dad could catch the big one. Uh-huh. And that one moment made the entire trip. Yeah. I mean, we, we, that, that's six months ago now. Yeah. yeah. And it's still a conversation weekly in our house. It was one of those connections mm-hmm. that you search for in your life. And the only way we could get there is because I had the freedom as a business owner. Yeah. You know, it's funny is my son and I have the same thing. We, we took him to, uh, we were in Belize and we took him out uh, fishing and we went beyond the reef, as they call it there, because um, he was a little bit too young to fly fish and try to do that. But he caught his first cuda. And I mean, I think it was big, it was big as he was, you know, almost 40 inches. And he caught nine different species of fish and dad caught a rock. I caught a piece of the reef. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, every time we hooked a fish, we gave it to him and he reeled it in. And uh, yeah, I, I caught a rock. So that's what he tells everybody. And he was so proud because when we came back that night, we, you know, got the fish filleted up. We took it out. And he's like, man, I fed nine people that night. Because we had nine, you know, we had six people with us. We met some other people that were out. And he was so happy. I was just ecstatic. And so how often now is Eli pushing you to go fishing? Uh, he, we, we went back up to Idaho when we were, had planned on it being the winter. Because my kids were living here in Houston. Snow right. is, unless it's going to be on Monday this Monday, week. Yeah. So, snow doesn't happen here. But yeah, so, winter is going to be three days. Yeah, exactly. You know? So they wanted to see real snow, and, and so we went back up there, had a blast. And he asked me on the on the way up there, he's like, "Well, are we going to get to fish this time?" And I looked at him, I said, "Eli, you remember that the water was about fifty degrees in the summer? Yeah. At the end of the summer, 
it's going to be a heck of a lot colder this time. I don't want to go wading out in 30 degree water water for it stays the same. 12 it's, hours. That, those streams, it's, it's groundwater. It stays the same, dude. <laughs> yeah, okay. Tell my toes that. <laughs> I fell. Uh, I remember once we were steelhead fishing up in Michigan in the winter, and I fell. I slipped and fell and fill, filled the hip boot with water. Uh, <laughs> dude, it was like three more hours of just frigid. It was. It was not good. It was not. It didn't good. work like a wetsuit. It did not. Up. It did not work like a wetsuit. It filled up like a freaking uh, shot glass. <laughs> that was not easy to empty because you had to kick your. You had to sit down on the bank and kick it up, and it's like water's like running down your butt. You know, it's all it's just everything got wet. Nice, was, there was nice. nothing good about it. So what do you? What does he want to do? Because I know we talked a little bit about maybe doing a father son get get together. Let's get him out in a boat. Because you, you told him you're going to go marlin fishing with us in a couple of weeks, and he, he's like ready to go. Yeah, he's like so. So where when am I going? And he <laughs> and when I told him, I said, well, it's it's gonna it's gonna be an entrepreneurial trip, and and so not this time, son. He was kind of, he was kind of let down. I, he was all right, but we talked about you and I talked about doing a father son trip yeah, yep. in the in the summer. And he's like. Okay, he said, so the thing at our house now, my, my son is an inch shorter than I am now, uh -huh. which is, that alone is scary. And he's about as big around as my thumb. I mean, he's, he's a skinny kid. Um, and so his thing at the house now is, well, I'm going to have to start working out with my sister because my daughter is the big athlete in the family. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm going to have to start working out with my sister so that my arms are strong enough that I can reel these fish in because the trout almost killed me. What's a... What's a saltwater fish going to yeah, do? Yeah, what's, what's a kingfish going to do? You know, and, and that's going to be the fun thing. You know, I, was, I, was, I brought this uh, friend of mine, Kelly Howell, uh, took him on his first saltwater fishing trip. And he, he'd caught bass. And he, got some, he, he went to Mexico, and he caught some big bass, 12, 13-pound bass. And he said, great. We put him on a 50-pound tuna, and it about killed him. <laughs> he just, like, he's got that thing in the boat, and he just, he just, I got a picture of him. He just sunk down, and he's stuck between the council like this going, Oh my God. <laughs> like, you want to do it again? He goes, like, Give me 10 minutes, man. He goes, Give me 10 minutes to get up in and get this down, you know, because that's what it's like. It's, it's, it's way different. You know, the trip that we're going to go on in a few weeks, it's, it's hours of boredom interrupted by mass chaos. And that's the That sounds like part. owning a business. Yeah, kind of. It is. <laughs> well, that's, that's how we teach our business to fish because that's, that's what it is. But, you know, the, the, the trip we're hoping to do in the, this summer. Yeah, you know, we'll go king fishing and we'll catch some smaller snapper and stuff like that. But man, you get these kids on the kingfish, man, and they 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 go take a hundred yards in that first run, and um, it's it's wild. You know, it, it really is wild. So where do you guys? Where do you? Where, where are you looking at your dream trip? Where do you now that he's got this love that that, that you guys kind of got? Where do you really want to go? Uh, he he is really excited about the fly fishing thing. I mean, he hasn't done the salt water, so he mm -hmm. doesn't know what that's going to be like. But he's really, really excited about the king, about the trout fishing, fly fishing. So we're we're planning on going back up to see our friends in Idaho, um, probably along spring break. And so his question is, which river are we going to now? Last time we went to the Oahe River, which was over across the border from Boise and Idaho. Mm -hmm. I mean, excuse me, in in Oregon. In Oregon. So he's like, okay, which which river are we going to go fish now? And so I'm digging through, finding out. Okay, he wants it. He wants the fishing experience, but he wants a new a new fishing experience. fishing experience. No, it's kind of cool. I I mean, I used to live out in Oregon. I used to live in Bend, and okay. uh, I had a friend of mine from Bozeman, uh, Montana. So we drive out to Bozeman and we go catch cutthroat trout there. We were catching you know rainbows. Like my first rainbow was twenty two inch uh, on, on my fly rod, and it's like you're not supposed to catch your first fish being that big. Yeah, yeah. You know, and 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 stuff like that. So that that that's always fun. Uh, man, my my first fly rod fish was a ladyfish. And I was like standing in waist deep water and it jumped over my head. And nice. uh, that went. And my first bonefish, I swear to God, dude, my, my first bonefish was this big and it almost ripped the rod out of my hand. It <laughs> ran so hard. I was not expecting that. And when you're fishing with the guide's rod, you know, in reel, and it's like, you know, $400 reel and an $800 rod, <sighs> and it's like, boom, and that fish just takes it. And he was like, holy crap. You know, it's, it's, it's just interesting. You know, that's the fun stuff you're going to be able to have with your son, man. Watching him do all this stuff for the first time, you know, because how, how excited were you when he caught that fish? Uh, he, he didn't understand what he had done. Uh -huh. I mean, it was, it was the craziest thing. I'm, I'm jumping up and down. I've got my, my, my cell phone trying to take a video of it and watch, you know, watch it at the same time. And he, he thought it was great. He thought it was difficult reeling it in. I mean, he fought it for about 15 minutes before he got it, 15 minutes or so before he got it into the net. Um, 
but I was just over the top excited and he didn't really, it didn't sink in until probably about 24 hours after that. He's like, maybe it was even when we got back and he was talking to his friends about, right. I caught this fish and they're like, Whoa. I mean, yeah. so now it's sunk in. He realized that was, that was a really cool experience. Yeah. I mean, like with you, you're talking about your son out in Belize. I mean, you'll be having that same conversation 30 years from now. Yeah, yeah. We actually got him. I don't know, Jonathan, you pull it up. Pull up the Teach Your Business to Fish web, um, page on Facebook. There's actually a, a small video there of my son catching like a 35-pound black drum. And he, he did. He was supposed to come today, uh, but I was telling him he wussed out in the middle of the fight. He was like, Dad, I can't do this. And uh, he ended up netting the fish. And he just freaks out at the end. When we pull this fish up, I mean, I've got to hold it with two hands and pull it up. I mean, it's a big fish. And, he, and we were fishing right in Baytown. I mean, right yeah. against the rocks. I mean, we weren't out anywhere extravagant, um, somewhere like that. But it was just, uh, yeah, there, there he is pulling that fish in right there. And it is beating the living snot out of him. And uh, huh? Huh? If you go to the end of that video, yeah, you go to the end of the video, you can see it come up. But it was just so fun watching him, you know, try to do it. That's where he, that's where he wimped out. Uh, but when this fish comes up, he he just like freaks out. So he does net it and you know stuff like that. Yeah, oh, there wow. it is. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a really big fish, and uh, but but you know he, he he goes on to he goes on to Facebook to watch the video all the time. And saying, you know, Dad, this is really cool. This is really cool. I mean, I think barely fits in the net. And, you know, it, it's cool. Thanks, Jonathan. But, you know, those are the types of things that, you know, you start looking at and you start sharing those memories with your kid and, uh, and, and doing that. Who, who taught you to fish? I mean, or you know, my stepfather. Yeah. I, see, I had no one taught me. No one in my family fished. It's well, kind of really weird. My, my mom and my stepdad got married when I was 10. And he was, he was the huge male figure in my life growing up. Okay. He, and he was an entrepreneur. Okay. I, I think that's probably where I get some of the drive. And within the first couple months of them getting married, he bought a ski bass combo. Mm -hmm. And we were out on that thing. If we weren't skiing, we were fishing yeah, okay. at least three or four times a month. Yeah. And so it was all, for me, it was all... All freshwater stuff, no saltwater oh, stuff yeah, like you get the, down here because yeah. I'm up in Dallas. Yeah, I grew up in Michigan. So it's we lived on, we lived in this area. I lived on a canal, so I had two sides of my house was covered with water. Oh, right on. And um, biggest fish I saw in the canal was probably a 40-pound muskie, followed followed a lure up. But we caught a lot of three or four-pound bass, but a lot of 30 to 40-inch pike in the springtime. It was, it was kind of cool. So we got a couple minutes left. Again, how do people get a hold of you? Who should be looking to get a hold of you in uh, – what do we so, need to do? so our focus is real estate. Generally, that means commercial real estate, real estate development, uh, found formation of associations, property owner associations, uh, those, those types of things, uh, leases, contracts, title reviews. Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate's huge. Business, commercial law issues, forming a business, buying a business, selling a business, want to make your business more ironclad, those types of people. And then the third leg of the stool is the estate planning. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, my life cycle, I don't know if you've seen this, but my life cycle is someone starts a business and they're busting their tail to get it in the black. Mm -hmm. Once they get it in the black, they want to figure out how to stop paying rent. Mm -hmm. So then the commercial real estate piece comes in. Yep. They get that all working good. And then it's a question of where's the succession plan for this? Yep. Where's the, where's the structure for my life? It, it, you know, Something happens, God forbid. Yep, yeah, it's going to happen. Something's going to happen. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this talk with David. This is Michael Rager, your business guide. We will see you next week. We're out of here. Go out there and become a real success. Remember, that's build great relationships, equip your team for success, be ethical, and lead your people. Have a great day.